Now, to get the webinar started, here is Peter Gamel, Chief Technology Officer for Skyworks Solutions. Thank you, Steve. Today's webinar will cover 5G from the perspective of the RF front end. The, the material for today's webinar is based largely on the white paper from Skyworks Solutions, which will be available on our landing page. Links to both the landing page and the white paper will be available at the end of this webinar. Let's begin by looking at 5G from a high level. 5G is going to give us a hundred times increase in a, in a range of, ex, of performance indicators. Data rate will expand by a hundred times. Capacity will expand by more than a hundred times. The network will densify by a hundred times. Latency, your ability to retrieve information from the network will reduce by a hundred times. Reliability and battery life are both expected to, ex uh, to improve by almost 100 times. When we look at it, many new use cases will emerge, but in a way we can, we can take the autonomous car as a proxy for what the requirements are for both data rate and latency. The studies for autonomous driving suggest that you'll need about two gigabits per second real-time information, that is to say one to two milliseconds latency. And we can take that as a proxy for what we're driving towards, towards but with 5G data rates. The RF front end will have some unique perspectives and conflicting demands resulting from these higher data rates, new modulations, and longer battery life requirements. At a high level, some of the challenges will be the advanced modulation and new waveforms with high peak to average ratio, high power user equipment, wider bandwidths, 100 megahertz component carriers and up to 400 megahertz total bandwidth, massive MIMO and simultaneous multi-user MIMO, and finally the move to millimeter wave technology, first in fixed wireless access and then eventually in the handset. All these things will drive increased size of RF components. MIMO increases linearly with the, num the size with the number of components. Uh, unless new packaging techniques are, are derived, and the same is true of diversity. On the other hand, there are many opportunities. 5G is largely built on a TDD architecture. This enables new filter technologies and new filter architectures which can change the filter landscape, as well as when you move to millimeter wave, antenna integration offers some unique and new opportunities within the RF front end. Now let's turn to some of the details around the standard itself. 3GPP is building 5G on the legacy of LTE, a ubiquitous, secure, and scalable protocol. The 3G standard brought us text, 4G brought us low resolution video, and 5G will bring us an immersive, real-time augmented reality experience. Carrier aggregation MIMO and QAM have, have long been within the standard and have been building in complexity with each release. Really the beginnings of carrier aggregation started at release 7 and MIMO largely started in release 6 and release 7. Release 15 will be finalized at the end of this year and ratified in the early part of 2018. Release 15 is officially defined by 3GPP as the beginning of 5G, and a new logo shown on the slide has been created to, to signify the release, the emergence of 5G technologies. Today we're going to focus on high data rate mobile devices, but 5G really has three legs, uh, which will be discussed in later papers and webinars. Um, when we have devices which are high speed, with high speed data, they will also become smart and semi-autonomous. That means they need to interact with each other and other fixed devices and make decisions. This will drive massive machine type communication, device to device communication, uh, the leg of 5G on the right of, the, of this slide. Also with 5G, real time decisions will need to be made with access to the cloud. This will drive ultra-reliable, low-latency communication. From the Skyworks perspective, the, the move to high data rate will occur in three phases. 
And the first phase we'll see will be focused on high speed download. This is already occurring today as you move to the gigabit per second LTE Advanced Pro. In the second phase, the upload will, will, will be required at above a gigabit per second. We're already seeing the emergence of this with real-time video sharing through Facebook Live and similar applications. Finally, in phase three, millimeter wave will occur in the user equipment after the technology has been validated and fixed wireless access. Beyond the RF front end, 5G will have some new radio features that will not really be discussed in much detail today, but allow high density communications and more effective use of the spectrum. Uh, scalable TTI, allowing the packet size to vary, and the self-contained TDD subframe design both improve the performance in dense user environments. Would we need uh, up to 400 megahertz spectrum, we'll talk about it in much more detail later, but where do you find such spectrum? The spectrum below 6 gigahertz is pretty crowded already today, but there is availability of spectrum in the 3.5 three to 5 gigahertz. In the U.S., the spectrum has become crowded with LTE and CBRS, but in other parts of the world, we expect to see the beginnings of the 5G rollout below 6 gigahertz and using narrower channels in the U.S. in the 3.5 gigahertz spectrum. Above 6 gigahertz, you see a lot of a spectrum availability in the millimeter wave uh, regime, 28 gigahertz, 38 gigahertz, and 70 gigahertz, which will be uh, rolled out in the future. Some key takeaways for 5G. We view the enhanced mobile broadband part of 5G as the drive towards one gigabit per second, two millisecond latency, first in the upload, first in the download, and following in the, in the upload. RF content will be dramatically increased through MIMO and diversity, which requires aggressive shrinking of the system module size as the handset footprint is likely to remain more or less fixed. In terms of the spectrum, 5G will be largely TDD, although FDD is being considered for new radio and some of the lower frequency bands. The wider frequency bands and higher frequency bands are TDD, and this changes the filter landscape. One aspect of that change in the filter landscape is the emergence of more and more frequency bands, which may require a different architectures for switch plus filter. Uh, some of which has been explored in a recent publication by Dave Pelkey and Kevin Walsh, also on the webinar today. As we move to millimeter wave, millimeter wave deployment in the handset is likely to be delayed due to the battery life challenges associated with millimeter wave technology in the handset. But we will see 28 gigahertz in fixed wireless access and fiber to the curve type applications. Now let's turn to a deeper dive on 5G requirements, which will be presented by Kevin Walsh, Senior Director for Mobile Marketing. Thanks, Peter. L let me take a few minutes to give some background on the current status of LTE networks uh, and the devices, and the motivations for improved performance leading to next generation 5G technology. Um, Certainly one thing that we see is, is a requirement for speed, the need for speed for consumers. It, it would be unimaginable to think of a day without access to data on your mobile device. It's so completely integrated into our daily lives. Whether we use that for immediate access to enhance productivity or we're just frittering the time away waiting for our next appointment, you know, any daily snapshot of life will show phones and smartphones are uh, immediate in present in our lives. It's hard to say what's fueling the insatiable demand for data. I, I'd like to think it's really because the experience for the device and the network is improving generation to generation. One analogy I like to think of is it's a, a flywheel effect. As the devices and the networks improve and the user experience uh, improves, we use larger and larger amounts of data, and this is verified by many studies out in the market. It's really a positive reinforcement factor that's uh, part of our daily lives. 
There is a little bit of a downside to, to that success, though. Uh, Ericsson Mobility did a report and, and measured uh, consumers' uh, perception of the device network interaction. And really, they came up with a, a, a KPI, or a key performance indicator. And it really related to the time to content. Um, so when you push a button, you want your data, really, you're looking for instantaneous uh, feedback. As seen in the chart above, Ericsson quantified the time to content to, to de determine what's a positive experience and what's a, a bad experience, obviously a subjective thing from the eye of the beholder. But it really came down to the dreaded buffering wheel. Anytime uh, we see that buffering wheel, it starts to fuel the frustration for, for users. It's an it's a LTE equivalent of a dropped call, if you will. From the picture above, it looked like the uh, six-second threshold from the uh, Ericsson report was where their, uh, their satisfaction uh, measured kind of moved over the threshold, if you will. My personal number's a, a lot lower than that, but, uh, you know, I'll, I'll leave it to the reader to figure out where they are. But whatever your threshold is, when we want data, doesn't matter where we are, what we're doing, we want immediate satisfaction, and really that is a reflection of both the network and the device. And that's the challenge to the industry is how do we improve customers' uh, KPIs or perceptions of both the network and the device. So we've seen other studies. This one happens to be from Huawei. Uh, and what we're just looking at and what they looked at is what is the consumer behavior related to the video experience? So uh, a, a same view where they looked at uh, customer satisfaction index, uh, and it was really a subjective opinion to how, how users perceived the quality of the experience. It really measured the impact of both data rate and round trip time or latency on these scores. Uh, it should be no surprise that uh, higher data rates and lower latencies generated a more positive experience. So it's clear faster is better when it comes to both networks and devices. But just, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit more than that. I, I want to frame the importance of mobile data. We all know that mobile data has been increasing, but it's, it's moving from, you know, a video or the score of last night's game to much more significant impact on the mobile economy. Um, mobile advertising, I think, is roughly on the order of 80% of Facebook revenue. It's material in, in the terms of growing economies and moving forward. You know, think about Facebook, Amazon, Baidu, you know, a lot of the large, largest uh, global uh, corporations have a very distinct mobile footprint and uh, 5G is going to be very effective to uh, scale and go beyond that. So let's take a little bit of a look of where we are in the networks. Uh, this data comes from uh, the GSA Association, uh, and it looked at where we are in the state of the networks. Of the 708 networks, GSA reported that 147 of those networks, approximately 21%, were LTE advanced uh, networks. So they could support features like carrier aggregation, MIMO, uh, anything greater than release 10 and 3GPP. There were additional 374 LTE networks that were LTE compatible and able to get upgraded. So you can see about three quarters of the networks are LTE and, and moving. When we looked at the speed of the networks, just if I sub-segment onto the uh, LTE advanced, 102 uh, of the networks supported category 6, or 300 megabits in the downlink. In the same report, 52% um, of devices, you know, UE devices, could support up to category 4 or 150 megabits per second. These facts support the, the fact that movement towards higher data rate in networks and devices 
is, is alive and moving forward and has momentum. So the networks are really moving to higher peak data rates. However, there's, there's a conundrum here. Your, your actual speeds may vary. The theoretical peak speed in a network is only part of the story. It's really what happens in real life that gives the day-to-day the -day experience that we see. And those, those numbers are typically one to two orders of magnitude below the peak data rate. Um, you, know, you can look to Cisco VNI. M many reports will, will detail that. But, uh, you know, you can verify this on your own. There's applications on your phone from open signal, speed test. You can measure the speed of uplink and downlink on your device. And it's really instructive to do that. Take, take a look a couple times a day, and you can see, no matter, depending on where you are, where your location is, you know, you can get varying uh, results uh, throughout the day. So what the Skyworks did is we took some of the data on Ookla website, uh, and we, we looked at just a single phone. The, uh, this happened to be the iPhone 6. So it's a, the same device looked across all different countries, uh, and we just categorized it by LTE, leaders, medium, median, and emerging. And you can see a wide disparity in downlink and uplink uh, data rates. And so most of that has to be attributed to the, to the network factors, right? So uh, in all real world cases, you know, we're not matching the theoretical peak speeds of the networks. And really that's the core challenge for the industry. How do we then take that data uh, and raise that by a factor of 100 as, as was mentioned before? We, the, the results are straightforward. We need to improve and how are we going to do that? So we're going to introduce a little bit of our view of the network of the future. Um, as we mentioned, uh, there's going to be an LTE core network. That's not going away. Everything in 5G is going to be built upon that. Uh, so you can see the conventional network has the LTE macro station, uh, typically a small cell. These are in the sub-6 gigahertz uh, frequency range. And the UE device will have a, um, it'll be able to work in both 4G, but increasingly we'll start to have multi-radio content. So we'll start to introduce, you know, much more reliance on, on YLAN and, um, and ELAA and LAA techniques, as well as start to, to bring in 5G uh, below 6 gigahertz. So that's all the developments that are going to take place over the next couple of years uh, and that we'll talk about. The other portion of the network that we uh, are thinking for 5G is there will be millimeter wave um, activity. Most of that millimeter wave activity, at least in the early stages from a Skyworks perspective, uh, tends to be uh, practical more in a fixed wireless application. We think the mobility uh, will be there in uh, some certain time, but we're going to have to work out a lot of the technical challenges to make that a, a true reality. So I think, you know, suffice it to say, um, there's a lot of newness in the 5G, but there's also uh, LTE underpinning that says the devices and what we're commonly used to will get iterated as we're able to support both LTE Advanced Pro and 5G NR in devices that look conventional to us today in our smartphones. So at this point, I want to bring in Dave Pelkey, Director of Systems, to talk about the details of standardization. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, let's, let's dig into that uh, in terms of progress towards 5G. So let's start with this high-level picture of 3GPP release timelines. And you can see we've overlaid callouts that indicate specific features and the rough timing for when they're actually introduced uh, into the market. Release 12, which is a continuation of LTE Advanced. Release 13, LTE Advanced Pro. And Release 14, LTE Advanced Pro SE are shown here for LTE. But it's important to consider that the standardization effort is a continual evolution of capability that spans many releases. And features continue to be introduced for the EUTRA LTE standard in releases even after Release 14. 
Critical aspects of LTE Advanced Pro through Release 14 are shown here. Higher order MIMO, continued expansion of wider bandwidth support with carrier aggregation or CA, including LAA and ELAA in the unlicensed Wi-Fi bands, and higher order modulation like 256 QAM that we will discuss in detail later. Those things really are the keys to enable gigabit per second data rate performance in LTE as we'll calculate. The evolution toward 5G includes all of these advanced 4G features. Much of release 15 includes both sub-6 gigahertz as well as millimeter wave technological considerations. Uh, with most, most of the early commercial impact in the handset, or UE, coming from the widening of sub-6 gigahertz bandwidth and CA, in addition to the LTE anchor. The so-called so official 5G includes, as Peter mentioned, changes to the physical layer and modulation, reduced latency in the frame timing, et cetera. And all of those things are important, but they're actually going to make less impact than the bandwidth widening aspects to the data rate. A revolution in millimeter wave technologies for personal communications is standardized in both release 15 and 16, but the official 3GBP implementation of the millimeter wave 5G technologies will be introduced to market somewhat later than the sub-6 gig, as shown. Now let's zoom in on 5G standardization and the market roll-off. The 3, 3GPP standardization of 5G technologies is driven from a work plan that includes study items, then work items, and eventually culminates in specification release. An important recent change that was made in mid-March has accelerated the non-standalone operating mode. This, this NSA, or non-standalone, mode is defined as the addition of 5G services on top of an existing LTE anchor, and it uses the LTE core packet network. This mode will need to support dual connectivity, the simultaneous operation of both the LTE and 5G services, in a kind of uplink carrier aggregation where the combinations of uplink and downlink in the two simultaneous services need to be concurrently supported. Now, the NSA operation uh, is going to be completed by, as Peter mentioned, December of this year, and final specs delivered uh, by March of 2018. The standalone operation, which is defined as 5G services entirely self-sufficient, operating on its own 5G core network without the LTE anchor, is still scheduled to be uh, definition complete by June 2018 and final spec released September 2018. There's a lot of activity going on now, and early trials and demonstration events include some major sporting events like the Pyeongchang 2018 Winter Olympics in Korea, the FIFA World Cup in Russia in 2018, and Summer Olympics in Tokyo in 2020. And these may include a mix of both sub-6 gigahertz and millimeter wave technologies and some really impressive high data rate, high definition, immersive video experiences and coverage of those events. Large-scale sub-6 gigahertz trials and field tests of pre-commercial 5G technology uh, in the UE in user equipment or handsets are being aggressively driven first in China and aim to realize nationwide commercialization in 2020. China Mobile has really taken a lead here. They've established innovation centers to bring together the entire wireless industry. And it's a good example of the strong collaborative development effort that's driving the ecosystem on the indicated hardware development and this aggressive product launch schedule. On the millimeter wave side of the 5G story, early trials and pre-standard deployments are led by Verizon and their 5G technology forum to deliver millimeter wave-based services to pilot customers in, I think, up to 11 markets across the U.S. by mid of this year. This is a fixed wireless, last-mile application delivering enhanced FIOS services to the home. When will we see millimeter wave in the UE? Uh, it really depends on how you define that user equipment, which may include all types of data cards, laptops, fixed wireless, window-mounted in-home transceivers, basically everything that's not a base station. But it's hard to see that millimeter waves will happen sooner than 2025 for smartphones, and Steve will elaborate on this uh, challenge and progress a little later. In our, in our focus here on EMBB and sub-6 gigahertz, uh, that we see as the first implementation of 5G in smartphones. There's really three most critical aspects of the technology that are responsible for much higher data rates. First, MIMO, or multiple in, multiple out technology, which employs a number N or more antennas on the transmit side and at least N antennas on the receive side of the link to enable a single channel to carry effectively N times the data rate or N different unique data streams. 
The orthogonality of the antennas, multipath reflections, and the resulting differences in the radio environment enable the subsequent separation of these overlapping layers of data at the receiver. Second, the wider bandwidth, as mentioned previously, which widens the data pipe, basically doubling the bandwidth effectively doubles the data rate. And third, higher order modulation. MIMO and extended bandwidth involve transmission of symbols, but each of these symbols is represented by a number of bits. By changing the modulation and physical layer to effectively pack more bits into each symbol, a higher data rate can also be achieved. So QPSK is 2 bits per symbol, 16 QAM is 4 bits per symbol, and 256 QAM is 8 bits per symbol. So 256 QAM enables four times the data rate of QPSK. But there is an added constraint that a higher signal-to-noise ratio is required to make sense of all those bits. All of these three combined factors, along with the reduced latency and the capability to flexibly allocate quicker data services to each user, serve to increase capacity and efficiency of the network, which also has a tremendous effect on the overall data rate. Of these three critical aspects to enhance the data rate, I'm going to focus on the bandwidth here, and it's probably the most important. Uh, fundamental interest in the extension of 5G technologies to include millimeter waves is really largely based on taking advantage of the large amounts of spectrum available there. Mm. LTE Advanced has been extending support for wider bandwidth through, through carrier aggregation, or CA, where additional numbers of CA uh, channels and, or secondary carriers are simultaneously added to a primary component carrier. The number of CA combinations supported in the standard have grown exponentially, as shown on the left with now over 1,000 use cases of different band and bandwidth combinations defined. As shown here, uh, an ever-increasing number of simultaneous carriers is possible as well, defined for these cases. On the right, we show some simple depiction of LTE advanced, both contiguous intra-band and non-contiguous inter-band CA combinations, from a single primary component carrier up to 5 cc, along with the relative multiplication of the data rate as we go from 20 megahertz single carrier up to 100 megahertz 5cc for a five times multiplication of the data rate. 5G technologies widen the bandwidths further with much wider bandwidth for each component carrier, presently defined up to 100 megahertz for sub-6 gig, and larger aggregated total instantaneous bandwidth. For 5G and sub-6, this total aggregated instantaneous bandwidth is being considered now between 200 megahertz and 400 megahertz. And for, for millimeter wave, even wider bandwidths are available with component carriers being considered up to 400 megahertz, and total aggregated combinations of CA up to as much as 1.2 gig, and that's still in definition. Here we show the trade-offs for downlink in these critical data rate multipliers in LTE in relation to the user distance from the base station. So modulation order, aggregated bandwidth, and MIMO order. The center of the axis is where we find the highest data rate closest to the base station in the center of the cell. Looking at, at modulation, you can see that it starts with the highest order modulation in close. And as the device moves further from the E node B, the signal to noise ratio will degrade, and the UE will progressively reduce modulation in order to maintain the radio link. That means that in typical conditions, like uh, inside a building or further from the base station, you'll have lower data rates than when you're in line of sight, outdoor, in good conditions close to the tower. Similarly, MIMO orders will transition from 4x4 four four in ideal conditions to lower orders to save the link as well. And as Kevin described, the cell edge condition is really the critical thing to maintain minimum acceptable user experience. The impact of aggregated bandwidth really suffers less degradation with distance from the base station. There are some limitations due to capacity considerations, but the first approximation, almost the entire cell radius can be covered with any number of component carriers. So these multiplying factors have a strong impact on the data rate and data rate variation throughout the cell. And support for these features and the 3GPP defined UE category are summarized in the table at the bottom. If we turn towards the uplink, uh, it's a similar picture. While 256 QAM has been defined in release 14 for the uplink, it's not yet been adopted in commercial handsets. And uh, the same with 2x2 uplink MIMO. While it's already been standardized with two paths and uplink CA, we're just starting to see deployments to support these advanced features. And this will have a big impact over time as these roll out. For uplink, just as for downlink, modulation rates and MIMO order will also decrease as you get further from the center of the cell and the tower. There's a more pronounced reduction in data rates and data rate coverage for uplink 
as more CA component carriers are added to extend the bandwidth, transmit power is often reduced in order to meet emissions requirements. One future impact that will be seen on the user side is uh, the movement to add additional power classes to have higher transmit power, known as high power UE or HPUE techniques. These techniques will effectively increase transmit power from user equipment by about 3 dB, thus expanding the radius of cell coverage by about 20%. This is only one of the many ways that feature support in the UE can decrease large CapEx expenditure costs in the network. When range and coverage is more limited by the UE performance, as is the case of uplink for LTE, and UE enhancements to improve that limiting behavior can reduce the number of base stations that need to be built or enhance data rate coverage areas in more cost-effective ways than densifying the network. Uh, it's, a, it's an important aspect of UE development. The key takeaway from the discussion of these critical, critical multiplying factors defining the data rate is that really LTE and 5G technologies depend on the same map to get to this result. And, and many factors, including the modulation impact and the MIMO order, don't change significantly for state-of-the-art handsets when we migrate to 5G in sub-6. They're already extremely good in LTE Advanced Pro. The one factor that does improve significantly as we go from 4G to 5G is the additional bandwidth for sub-6 gigahertz 5G. And the good news is that LTE Advanced Pro is defined to be able to support more than one gigabit per second downlink data rates as demonstrated here. So if we run through this calculation a little bit, if one assumes 4 by 4 downlink MIMO with four data streams defined for each channel, there's a multiplying factor of four. Uh, along with the highest order modulation of uh, 256 QAM or 8 bits per symbol for a multiplying factor of 8, and a bandwidth of 60 megahertz made up of three 20 megahertz channels for a multiplying factor of 3. From the details here, you can calculate total data rates at 1.2 gigabit per second for LTE. And as these features roll out over more networks, our performance will continue to significantly improve over time. As we progress to adding 5G to the LTE anchor, the modulation order and MIMO support in the UE will not change from these assumed values here. And the critical impact will probably most, mostly come from the large additional bandwidth that we add with the 5G channels and their aggregation. As the inset note indicates, up to 400 megahertz additional bandwidth will greatly increase the overall multiplication of these factors and will be available throughout the wider portion of the cell as well to significantly lift up the overall average user experience. There are a couple factors that are more challenging for 5G. The first is that it's TDD, and the same channels used for both uplink and downlink, alternating use between them and effectively sharing time on the, on the existing channels. Because the downlink is not on continuously all the time, as is the case for FTD when, as we calculate here, there's a decrease in the duty cycle from 100% to about 60% for frame configuration one. And the more duty cycle required for any uplink data rate consideration will adversely require reduced duty cycle and data rate for the downlink. A second factor is that the uplink channel, just to support ACK acknowledge and, and not acknowledge, ACK NAC and control interfacing, requires at least 5% of the downlink data rate in order to maintain the, the uh, uh, the downlink data rate. And there are implications for the resulting uh, downlink data rate. A huge help in offsetting this challenge, of course, is, to support, is the support defined for uplink 2x2 two two MIMO. And when engaged, this basically means two simultaneous transmitters with unique data streams and an effective doubling of that uplink data rate. So as we've discussed, critical new spectrum is being standardized for 5G, and the band definitions are still under consideration in 3GPP. On the left, it's shown that there's a good deal of new TDD spectrum, as mentioned previously, in the 3 to 6 gigahertz range, around 3.5 gig and 4.5 gigahertz. So the spectrum in kind of 3.3 to 3.8, 3.8 to 4.2, and 4.4 to 4.99 uh, are all based on TDD or unpaired spectrum and generally have much wider bandwidth than their 4G predecessors. Specific proposals for the 3.3 to 4.2 gigahertz range and how to best segment this wide bandwidth for optimal management of insertion loss, out-of-band coexistence attenuation, and optimal reuse and support of band 42 and 43 CA and LTE are driving for a more flexible three-band plan, which allows for proper management of these challenges without preventing a single filter implementation if those issues are not required to be addressed. <clears throat> 
The other aspect of 5GNR on the right, which is much more revolutionary, will utilize millimeter wave spectrum, and the millimeter wave bands have uh, by far the widest achievable bandwidths and are available with some regions offering multiple gigahertz of spectrum. Industry consensus is building around the usage model of millimeter wave for fixed wireless applications, as mentioned. And applying millimeter wave technology to mo mobile devices is really going to represent a very high technological challenge for the near future. So now Steve will describe details around this, along with an outlook for how to best solve these difficult problems. Thank you, Dave. We would like to shift our focus now to the potential of using millimeter wave bands to achieve one or more of the use cases envisioned for 5G. Strictly speaking, the millimeter wave bands start at 30 gigahertz, where the wavelength is about 10 millimeters, and finish at 300 gigahertz. More generally, we see bands at 24 and 28 gigahertz, often referred to as millimeter wave bands, and we might say, well, they're close enough. This chart shows the attenuation in dB per kilometer versus frequency. There are clearly challenges in how we use and manage millimeter wave radio links. Unfortunately, there is a perception out there that attenuation of millimeter wave signals is the dominant challenge. This is not true. As can be seen in the chart, signal attenuation at 30 gigahertz is roughly 0.1 to 1 dB per kilometer in free space. Now, heavy rain, let's say an inch per hour, will push attenuation to about 8 dB per kilometer, so attenuation is not to be ignored. However, the more significant factors associated with millimeter wave propagation is signal blockage and the simple fact that the transmitted power falls as the square of distance. Fundamentally, Except for very short distances, millimeter wave links require some directivity of the EM signal to achieve sufficient SNR. In contrast, perhaps, with sub-6 gigahertz RF systems, millimeter wave links are not greatly inter impacted by interference, but rather are more affected by the signal-to-noise ratio and the physical location of the signal. Another misconception about millimeter wave bands is the idea that no formal licensing is required. In fact, while the spectrum is not crowded at 28 gigahertz or 39 gigahertz, a license from the FCC in the US is required for transmission, experimental or otherwise. It can be argued that the industry consolidation we are observing in the US is a consequence of the assets held by the various operators at 28 and, 20 and 39 gigahertz. Some examples include Verizon's acquisition of XO Communication or the deal for Straight Path, which is a large holder of licenses at 39 gigahertz. Looking into the future, this chart describes how spectrum above 5 gigahertz is available in each geographic zone. Adopting a sensible specification for the required band coverage from 3GPP is crucial to the success of 5G millimeter wave. If we are too ambitious and are trying to cover a very large fractional bandwidth in the first revisions of the spec, then 5G millimeter wave radio access technology is perhaps doomed to failure. We believe it makes more sense to restrict the early band plans from 3GPP to less than 15% fractional bandwidth as seen in option two. Jurisdictionally, we can see that specifying two bands, 24.25 to 27.5 gigahertz, and then 26.5 to 29.5 gigahertz will provide coverage in the US, Korea, Japan, and Europe. One of the more pragmatic ways to use millimeter wave spectrum is enabling fixed wireless connectivity as a replacement for fiber installation in the context of neighborhoods. This so-called last mile connection from the, from the network is what's envisioned. We can imagine this as a means to provide gigabit per second connectivity that might be further distributed to individual UE devices within a building using other radio access technologies. This is clearly a standalone situation. 
where we were not relying upon an LTE anchor to enable beam setup, user acquisition, or channel feedback. The system might, might have some ability to dynamically enable specific beams and even refine the beam as needed, but we don't think of the beam as tracking the UE in this particular use case. We believe fully mobile standalone operation using millimeter wave bands has a number of challenges, including discovery, handover, and beam management. Non-standalone operation will likely leverage existing LTE systems to ease the task of enabling a UE acquisition and handover. And from an industry perspective, we can, we, we can kind of expect a period of learning on how to use and manage millimeter wave radios. While there are clear challenges, one of the nicer benefits of using millimeter wave bands is that the wavelength allows us to build small antennas on the order of five to 10 millimeters. In addition, within a, a relatively small form factor, we can use phased array technology to help achieve directivity in both transmission and reception. The concept behind phased arrays is to use free space constructive and destructive interference in the electromagnetic signal emitted from each antenna element. In the far field, very useful gain of more than 20 dBi can be achieved in both transmission and reception. And the resulting directivity mitigates interference and introduces this new domain, the spatial domain, as a degree of freedom in the system. The small form factor of the phased array system also means that the size and weight of the antenna arrays can be reduced with the associated benefits in the mechanical supports. The main advantage of phased arrays, however, is that the directivity can be steered electronically rather than, rather than having to move a dish. Let's dig a little deeper into this idea of using millimeter wave be beams. The Friss transmission equation seen above shows us that the power received at the receiver is directly proportional to the gain or loss in the transmit and receive antennas but inversely proportional with the distance squared. You'll note as well that the received power goes as the square of wave, wavelength. Consequently, as we try to use smaller and smaller wavelengths, we must compensate with more and more gain in the transmit and receive path. In other words, a more and more focused beam. Now the beam forming gain is proportional to 10 times the log of the number of antenna, antenna elements in the array. In the context of a base station, 18 to 24 dB of gain can be achieved on both the receive and transmit side. However, recent studies have shown that beyond a certain number of antenna elements, the efficiency of transmission diminishes rapidly. This is a result of, the, of loss in the signal distribution within the array. Consequently, the focus of development for demonstration systems so far has been to use 8 by 8 or 16 by 16 element arrays. In the context of a UE device, whether a handset or something else, the integration of ante antenna arrays is much more problematic. The form factor of the handsets and their ergonomic engineering is challenging considering that we have cameras, high resolution screens, and other interface ports. You know, we scratch our heads, where are we going to put an array of antenna elements at millimeter wave plus all the other sub six gigahertz antennas? Once you have radio link margin in a stationary context, the challenge shifts to maintaining that link in a mobile context. To maximize the channel resource formed by the millimeter wave link, the beam must really track the UE or else the UE will simply move out of the beam. There needs to be a means to acquire and direct the beams, refine alignment, and then even hand off to another base station as needed. These capabilities are extremely challenging to engineer, and the assistance of the sub-6 gigahertz radio links, whether 5G or 4G, is likely going to be needed. Closing this section of the webinar, we wanted to discuss possible front-end technologies for millimeter wave front-ends, just for a minute. From a technology perspective, 
phased arrays and the associated transceivers supporting each antenna element have a fairly clear path to 5G component integration. Below 6 gigahertz, traditional technologies such as 3.5 HPTs, silicon on insulator, and acoustic filters are heavily used to build front-end components such as power amplifiers, low-noise amplifiers, and RF switches. Above 6 gigahertz, the very same semiconductor technologies will be used for 5G millimeter wave RF blocks. One sharp difference, however, is that acoustic filtering is no longer available at those much higher frequencies. The choice of which technology to use for highly integrated up-down conversion and, and other signal conditioning blocks like amplification and switching really boils down to advanced silicon-based platforms such as silicon germanium by CMOS and silicon on insulator. In these platforms, the inherent cutoff frequency of the transistors without parasitic loading is over 300 gigahertz. So consequently, we have sufficient gain to build efficient RF circuits. However, in situations where the linear power output requirement from each antenna element exceeds, let's say, 18 to 22 dBm, the more exotic platforms such as uh, gallium nitride high electron mobility transistors may be required based on our survey of published work. Finally, the filtering at millimeter wave bands will likely rely on integrated passive device such as coupled transmission lines. All right, I'll hand it back to uh, Peter to uh, provide some uh, concluding remarks. Thank you to Kevin, Dave, and Steve for all the detailed presentations on the emergence of 5G. In conclusion, the user experience and the increased use of high-definition video, both in the downlink and uplink, is driving the deployment and the standardization of 5G faster than many people had anticipated. This is really the first time that I've been involved with a standard where we're seeing the standard pulled in rather than pushed out due to the user needs. The use of 5G as, de as developed by 3GPP and the uh, evolution from 4G to LTE Advanced Pro to 5G is based on a standard which is both secure and scalable. Mm -hmm. While other proposals for 5G have been, have been made, we strongly believe that the 3GPP approach is going to dominate in the industry. Skyworks is actively developing 5G solutions for all phases, both sub-6 gigahertz and millimeter wave, and millimeter wave both for fixed wireless access as well as, the, as, well as user equipment. The vision of Skyworks, connecting everyone and everything all the time, and the vision of the 5G network are really in perfect harmony. Now I'll turn the webinar back to the moderator for questions and answers. Okay, gentlemen, thank you for that presentation. Now let's take a look at some of the questions from our audience. First question is, what are the main filtering challenges for 5G below 6 gigahertz? Uh, this is Peter, and I'll take that one. And let's uh, expand and not just say below 6 gigahertz, but let's look at the overall filtering and filter landscape. I think the easiest place is to start where Steve left off in the millimeter wave. Millimeter wave filters can no longer be the traditional acoustic wave, saw, baw, F-bar filters that we've seen in LTE and other sub-6 gigahertz applications such as Wi-Fi. In this frequency regime, the filtering will need to be based on dielectrics, ceramics, or transmission line or lumped elements, as Steve described previously. So a dramatic change in the filter technology, even when those filters are placed in handsets. Below 6 gigahertz, there are two main uh, challenges and changes that will occur in the filter landscape. The first is what we already heard from uh, Dave earlier, the, the exploding number of bands and band combinations, which has started in LTE and has continued in LTE Advanced Pro, 
is really going to drive the need for new front-end filter architectures. Mm -hmm. One example which shows the benefit of switch flexor architectures was recently published in a paper by Dave Pelkey and Kevin Walsh. As we move to 5G with wide component carriers and extremely wide aggregate bandwidth, 400 megahertz in the lower frequency bands, and as Dave mentioned, potentially exceeding one gigahertz in the higher frequency bands, these bands will become TDD. TDD means that, uh, means that the use of band pass filters as opposed to inplexers will be prevalent. In our view, this tends to favor saw-based filter architectures. Okay, great. Peter, thank you for that answer. Um, another question for you. How does Wi-Fi play into this view of 5G? Uh, this is Dave. I'll take that one. Um, so Wi-Fi offload is really an important uh, aspect of how everyone uses their phones. And uh, I think operators want to encourage customer support for the for that feature. So we have both IEEE, uh, Wi-Fi defined wireless technologies, as well as 3GPP cellular uh, uh, technologies. So both exist in the phone today, and we see that continuing as we uh, bring 5G into the mix as well. Uh, there, are, there are two issues, I guess. 3GPP has standardized a couple aspects of interworking to better coordinate between Wi-Fi and, and the LTE uh, uh, standard versus Wi-Fi coordination with LTE, uh, which has a certain form of aggregation but doesn't make any changes to the Wi-Fi uh, legacy core network. Uh, and there's even some aspects of LTE timing to better manage coordinated uh, concurrency of those two services. Uh, many of those things have been defined in the standard for quite a while, and the features continue to be enhanced uh, over time through release 14. Uh, the second is Licensed Assisted Access, or LAA, which we talked a little bit about, uh, which operates actually LTE directly in the 5 gigahertz unlicensed band as supplemental downlink carrier aggregation in the case of LAA and release 13, and Enhanced Licensed Assisted Access, or ELAA, in uh, release 14, which adds uplink transmit capability in the 5 gig band. So there's a, a, an essential interworking at play here between IEEE and 3GPP in the shared use of these wireless services uh, in the unlicensed band. Fair coexistence is managed with uh, listen before talk and a lot of the threshold detection of available channels opportunistically used in the handset. Um, Another issue, I guess, in terms of Wi-Fi and 5G is a critical aspect of uh, the upper part of 5 gigahertz on license band, which is uh, going to be focused and dedicated towards vehicle-to-vehicle -to -vehicle and vehicle-to-everything connectivity. And uh, the low latency of 5G, uh, certain data rate, and other aspects of the way that 5G is uniquely going to be defined is an enabling aspect of getting autonomous uh, vehicles established as a major technology. Okay, thank you, Dave. Um, another question for you, gentlemen. What are some of the front-end component challenges associated with wide bandwidth 5G signals? Uh, this is Dave. I'll t I can take that one t as well. Um, it's a really good question. So uh, the wider bandwidth of the uh, pass bands is really a large challenge, and uh, Peter addressed that a little bit. Filter technologies really have to change. Uh, so we do not see that these extreme uh, the extreme bandwidth of these pass bands is going to be able to be addressed with acoustic filter technologies like SAW and FBAR and BAW. Uh, so they'll be implemented instead with more conventional LC uh, topologies, and those reactances will be integrated in a number of different passive substrate technologies. Um, the LNA and PA uh, as active devices can be broadbanded to be able to cover that entire pass band, so we don't see that as much of an issue. And you can look to the extremely wide 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi implementations as kind of examples of how these technologies can be implemented with good performance. Uh, a much more difficult part of that question, though, is, is the uh, wide instantaneous bandwidth. And as we mentioned, there's up to 400 megahertz of instantaneous bandwidth that will be required uh, at any given moment of time. And so if you look at most of the uh, high-tier feature-rich phones today, uh, they use what's called envelope tracking or ET technology for the power amplifier. And it's really a, a kind of a complicated reconstruction scheme that combines drive power and supply voltage modulation uh, 
uh, to kind of reconstruct the ideal uh, signal, and it also relies on uh, some fairly heavy digital pre-distortion in order to do that correctly. So for bandwidths beyond 40 to 60 megahertz, really ET will be broken, and we see that as a, as a result of a number of uh, sensitivities. So there's a, a, an extreme sensitivity with increasing bandwidth to amplitude phase delay mismatch. There are uh, limitations in bandwidth of the supply modulator. Um, the amount of decoupling capacitance that can be tolerated on the shared supply line for VCC and the supply to the PAs. And uh, there, there becomes an impractical need at wide bandwidths for digital pre-distortion. Uh, so these are just a few of those issues. I, I think, uh, but this is really all compounded by the fact that ET was originally selected and promoted and has been uh, fairly successful in lower frequency ranges, mostly because of uh, an advantage for DC current consumption, that the efficiency overall was improved. Uh, but when you get to these wider and wider bandwidths, the, um, the actual supply modulator, this envelope tracker, uh, will start to burn much, much more current, and eventually uh, much above 40 to 60 megahertz. You start to burn so much current in the tracker that the DC efficiency advantage goes away as well. So, uh, really, the technology of choice for power amplifiers is, is fixed supply, uh, or so-called APT type uh, technologies for the PA. And there's some additional constraints in terms of ultra-wide bandwidth support. The devices have to be extremely uh, good in, in having very small memory effect. Uh, but there's been a lot of uh, very good progress in advanced topologies now for very high output power capability and extremely high efficiency. Uh, fixed supply approaches, and th those are the ones that we see uh, in this space for wide bandwidth 5G. Okay, thanks, Dave. Our next question here is, can millimeter wave signals really be expected to serve mobile users, or will they be restricted to stationary radio links? Yeah, uh, Steve will take that one. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a good question. Uh, I think, I think there are some clear engineering challenges to work through. Uh, Peter Gamel mentioned at the very beginning, you know, not burning through your battery in, in five minutes of transmit on a, on a UE device is, is, is going to be one of those challenges. There's, there's less efficiency in terms of the power amplifier and the receive chain um, at, at millimeter wave frequencies. So that's a major challenge. Um, and, and we're going to need some improvement there. The other challenge in, in, in our minds is this whole question of acquiring the UE device, whether that's a, um, you know, a laptop or a handset. Uh, it, we, we talked about the need for, for beams of electromagnetic uh, uh, energy to be radiated. And, and so that spatial domain means you have the, the, the base station or wherever it is has to find the UE device. And, and, and establish the link. And I think that's a major challenge. We think, you know, from a relatively small base, and base station to a relatively small uh, uh, UE device, how does that link get established? That's going to be a very, very tough challenge. Okay, thanks, Steve. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at one last question. The complexity of mixing 4G and 5G systems within user equipment seems overwhelming. Are we going to see two sets of modems and transceivers within consumer devices? Hey, Steve. Uh, this is Kevin Walsh. I'll, I'll, I'll field that one. I think um, the way I kind of look at uh, systems like this is it's a time of disruption. You know, we, we see predecessors going from 3G to 4G. Um, in that area, specs are still not stable. People are doing development. We talked about we're doing this on top of an LTE anchor on existing equipment. So I would I would look to a vision where there's existing 4G. Uh, we're going to add a supplemental 5G modem in the early years, um, work that through a couple of generations and cycles. And once we achieve stability in, in requirements, business models, then I think you'll look to the next wave where you get a consolidation of the modems over time and some you know, um, reformation of the uh, RF front end. But I, I, I look to predecessors to see what's going to happen, and it really looks like they'll be separate for a while and then eventually integrate uh, over time. Okay, great. Thank you for that answer, Kevin. 
All right, we're going to wrap up the Q&A right there. If we did not get to your question, please refer to Skyworks 5G white paper for more information. To find out more information regarding today's presentation, please feel free to visit www.skyworksinc.com forward slash 5G. And as always, feel free to email Skyworks at sales at skyworksinc.com with any questions. Thank you to all of our audience members for joining in for this presentation, and have a great rest of your day.